recognize it, I did not remember, I'm sorry, <laughs> in that case. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to, to present you our, our work. So I've been involved in defense of uh, religious freedom for uh, more than 40 years now, at the time of the Cold War in, the, in Europe. And uh, uh, it's a, really a personal uh, commitment, because I was an atheist before, and I became Christian uh, at the age of 27. And uh, it, it's uh, through a book that one of my students gave me, uh, that I came to the Christian faith and to this uh, commitment of uh, religious freedom. She gave me a book that was uh, entitled uh, uh, Tortured for Christ. It was the story of a Romanian pastor who had been in prison for 13 years uh, in uh, Romania, tortured. And uh, after those 13 years, uh, he was released and he, he well, uh, could leave uh, his country, not really uh, officially, and he created a network of uh, organizations working for religious freedom around the world. And so I was absolutely impressed by, by his book, by his uh, testimony. And um, at the end, there was an address uh, in France, and so I wrote to that address and uh, I came in contact with... Uh, uh, a couple of uh, um, Romanians that had emigrated uh, to France and they were defending uh, religious uh, freedom in communist countries. And so I started making translation for them because I was teaching uh, languages uh, at the time, uh, full time. And uh, that's, how, that's how it started. Then I organized uh, uh, demonstrations in Brussels uh, in front of several uh, embassies uh, at the time. And then uh, <coughs> I went deeper and deeper, and uh, I created uh, uh, Human Rights Without Frontiers in uh, 1988. Uh, so it's now uh, 30 years old. We celebrated uh, this anniversary last year, and we invited uh, Martin, and we were very pleased to join us. Uh, and because we, we have known each other for a long time, for, since the 1990s, where in Belgium that uh, anti-sect war was really raging against all minority uh, religions. And so I appreciated the way he managed, he, he managed to deal with uh, the hostility coming from the authorities in Belgium and also from the media and uh, from, uh, let's say, society uh, in, in general. And I visited, of course, the temple in Belgium uh, on, on several uh, occasions. But, so, the, the, the way we are uh, working, first I would say we are not, uh, not connected to any religion in, in particular. So we defend everybody, we, defend, we don't defend religions, we defend people, we defend individuals who have specific beliefs, uh, and what are those beliefs? So we defend Christians, uh, Orthodox, Catholics, uh, Protestants, we defend Falun Gong practitioners, Hare Krishna devotees, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, <coughs> and so on and so on. So we are absolutely neutral uh, in these matters because the, the Universal Declaration, the, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, specifies that uh, it's the right of any person to have any belief uh, that uh, they want to, to, to adhere to. So what, what we are doing is uh, trying to uh, inform uh, people who have some influence uh, in the world uh, on uh, religious uh, freedom uh, issues. So our targets uh, for our information, submitting our information, is the members of the European Parliament. Uh, we, we have 10,000 email addresses. We have so email addresses of the members of the European <coughs> Parliament, members of uh, pa national parliaments, uh, 15 uh, member states of the European uh, Union, uh, all the embassies in Brussels, all the embassies in Geneva, all the embassies uh, in uh, New York and uh, Washington, uh, journalists, uh, think tanks in Europe, in the, the United States, uh, press correspondents, media, etc. And throughout the years, the third, those 30 years of activities, we have developed a whole network of correspondents around the world, people who provide us with either news or information, uh, who want to remain anonymous, but who would like the cases of persecution to be known by those influential people and uh, institutions. And every day we have a newsletter uh, focusing on two cases per day uh, of uh, religious uh, freedom uh, violations. And so what we select 
uh, gets right in the hands of those people, I would say, and institutions that uh, I just mentioned. And we have the possibility to see who reads uh, our newsletter. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, most of them, as I said, are interested, uh, who are interested are from uh, parliaments. In, in the European Union and also the, the State Department uh, in Washington, the, the U U.S. Commission on International Freedom, etc., uh, etc. Et so this is our daily work. So I read a lot. We have more than uh, 150 sources of information, so open from uh, open sources plus private channels through which uh, specific information uh, reach us. Reach yes, <coughs> uh, reach us. Uh, then we we also we have also built a database of um, pr uh, prisoners, uh, religious prisoners. So uh, people who really uh, want to keep to adopt a new a new faith or to keep uh, uh, their their faith, uh, who want uh, to express uh, freely their 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 religious uh, convictions, <coughs> who want to have assemblies uh, to worship, so the basic, the fundamental uh, rights of uh, linked to religious uh, freedom. And uh, so we monitor that on a regular uh, basis. Every year we have a, a report about uh, religious freedom. It was usually country by country. And um, also we focus on uh, prisoners. Uh, as I said, religious uh, prisoners. For the moment, we have a database with uh, more than 4,000 documented uh, cases uh, of people who are behind bars because of their purely religious activities. Not political activities, not because they, are, they belong to a specific uh, ethnic group, but purely uh, religious uh, activities. Uh, the most numerous is in China. Uh, then also uh, Iran, Russia, North Korea is a black spot because we don't have any information but uh, religion is, is forbidden uh, anyway. So uh, we are the only ones uh, to have that database of 4,000 documented uh, cases of, uh, of prisoners. Uh, you can go, I will give you the, our website afterwards and you can go and see it's on the, on the home page of, uh, of our site. Uh, we. We have a lot of activities in the European uh, Parliament. We organize regular events about religious freedom, and, but also human rights in general, because it's human rights without frontiers, and uh, a big part of it is uh, focusing on the religious freedom. Uh, we, also, we are also active, we've been active uh, in uh, Warsaw at the OSCE for 25 years. Every year there is a, a huge uh, conference where all the member states of the OSCE, more than, more than 50, are present, and we can approach the delegations, we can organize events, we can make statements, they are on the website of the OSCE. So this is a general advocacy uh, strategy uh, that uh, we have uh, worldwide uh, from, from Brussels. So uh, today, yeah, th there is also uh, <coughs> Uh, an, an important issue that uh, we, we addressed a few years ago, it's, it was in Japan. Uh, for me, I consider it's one of our major victories uh, in, in, in the 30 years. It concerned the Unification uh, Church, the Moon Church, uh, that maybe uh, some, uh, some know about uh, uh, under that name, uh, the Moon Church. Uh, in Japan, for about 40 years, uh, people who were converting to, to that church got in trouble with uh, Protestant pastors. And those Protestant pastors, anti-sect pastors, were organizing some sort of a kidnapping with the parents to remove them from the Unification Church. But it, was, it also happened with uh, uh, people who converted to the movement of the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, <coughs> kept them, uh, let's say, imprisoned in, uh, in private apartments, houses, uh, and so on, until they recounted uh, their faith. So that's what we call in, in America and a, a little bit in Europe, deprogramming. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> no, that's what I know is familiar, certainly familiar to, uh, to you. And in, four, uh, in 40 years' time, they told me at the time that uh, 
uh, four thousands of them have been uh, uh, kidnapped. And uh, the one that was incarcerated by his family uh, for the longest period, it was 12 years. 12 years, yeah. And if he went to court and finally uh, uh, won a case, the only person who won a case, um, it was in a, a civil case, not even a, a criminal case, because uh, it was, it's part of the, the Japanese culture that the police was not collaborating on such cases, neither the, nor the judiciary, uh, nor the, the legislative. Uh, so it was, uh, and, and the, the media uh, neither. Uh, and, and so it was a sort of collective omerta uh, silence on, on that issue. So I went to, to Tokyo, I spent two weeks there, and I, for two weeks, every day, morning, afternoon, evening, I interviewed victims of uh, such kidnappings and, and, and deprogramming. And we, we published this book, I just have three copies left here. Uh, we published this book, and we raised this issue at the United Nations, and uh, uh, that victim that was kept for, for 12 years in uh, captivity, finally, that's the only one, uh, won that case. And uh, so that, that was finally sufficient to uh, frighten, I would say, the pastors that were organizing that sort of deprogramming with uh, the, the parents. And so we are happy that we, we solved uh, uh, that case. But there are also other cases that, that we solved. Huh? Uh, but I will not go uh, further into the, those details because I, I want to address the issue. The title is The Rise of Nationalism. And I changed a little bit the title. I, I wrote the, the Rise of Nationalisms because there is not one nationalism, but there are various sorts of nationalisms. Uh, each is specific, each of them is specific, and has a, a specific impact on religious freedom. So that the full title is The Rise of Nationalisms in Europe and Their Impact on uh, Religious uh, Freedom. So I want to share with you some reflections about the interaction between uh, national identity, national, uh, nationalism, state and society, and non-mainline religions or belief uh, communities. Because when I said we defend all religions, uh, I also want to, to say that we also defend atheists, because atheists are in prison in, the, in uh, Egypt, uh, for example, and uh, some other uh, Muslim uh, countries. So nationalism uh, is an ambiguous concept about which experts and scholars have expressed a divergent and even conflicting opinions and have failed to reach a consensus on its definition. Nationalism is often connotated negatively when it is related to conflicts and various forms of social hostility, but it can also be a constructive driving force in a collective identity building process in other contexts. Nationalism is a complex phenomenon. Many scholars argue that there is more than one type of nationalism and that the word uh, should be used in the plural, which I did, instead of the singular, as each form of nationalism is different, has its own ingredients and manifests itself in uh, various ways. Nationalism may be part of the official state ideology, but nationalism may also express itself through political civic or cultural movements in minority populations along ethnic, religious, cultural, linguistic or ideological lines as a safe haven for their collective and individual identity and survival. Such characteristics are however not mutually exclusive and many forms of nationalism often combine some or all of these elements to varying degrees. This sort of nationalism can also give birth to separatist movements if state policies are not inclusive and tolerate social injustice and discrimination. My reflections will focus on the current negative impact of nationalism and nationalist movements from a human rights point of view on the life of non-mainline religious communities and their members. I will also uh, analyze the, uh, the handlings of aggressive nationalist forces in three specific countries of the European Union, as I was requested, 
but there are many other nationalisms in the, in the world, India, for example. Uh, but those three countries in Europe will be Bulgaria, Hungary, and uh, Italy. And the impact of nationalism in those countries on the religious freedom of uh, uh, minorities. The first issue that I will uh, deal with is the interaction between religious identity, uh, national identity, nationalism, and religious uh, minorities. The, the first part will be rather philosophical, I would say, afterwards it, it will become uh, more, more concrete. The identification of a majority population with a particular religious or philosophical tradition or a church can shape a national identity that is not inclusive or that even, is, uh, that even rejects, sorry, <laughs> rejects uh, inclusiveness. This individual and collective sentiment can be and is often instrumentalized or politicized. A number of European states, which from their past until the present day have shaped their national identity according to a specific religion or philosophical worldview, have created a hierarchy of religions and belief systems in which privileges and discrimination vary from level to level. The intensity of national identity professed by the state and its institutions can lead to some sort of soft nationalism, which disregards diversity, otherness, and inclusiveness, and sidelines but does not advocate or uses violence against specific and non-mainline religious groups or their members. However, a certain threshold, after a certain threshold, the intensity of national uh, identity professed by the state can lead to aggressive nationalism. <laughs> I make a distinction between soft nationalism and uh, its impact on the life of minorities and aggressive nationalism. <clears throat> Nevertheless, in both contexts, aggressive, soft or aggressive, <coughs> nationalist political, cultural and social movements can be at work and lead to intolerance, hostility, acts of violence against persons and communal institutions or buildings. The relationship between national identity, religious identity and politics can be broken down into aspects. The politicization of religion, and the converse influence of the majority religion on politics. In this regard, a widely shared religion can be seen as a dynamic factor uh, contributing to a sense of national unity. The influence of a dominant religion supported by a majority of the population can lead to politi political activism and action reinforcing its position and its own values in society, but also disregarding the specific needs of religious minorities. In Europe, national identity rooted in a specific religious or philosophical identity is largely prevalent in orthodox majority countries, such as Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Russia, just to name a few. If in those countries, if uh, you are only in those countries, you are only considered a true Greek, a true Bulgarian, a true Russian, if you are Orthodox. <coughs> Catholic majority countries are not immune either from nationalism. In Poland, in Hungary, the religious element of national identity manifests itself by political and social resistance to the increasing religious diversity and rejection of Muslim migrants and refugees. Some secular countries where the state professes its non-interference in church matters are not beyond reproaches. France, for example, sticks to its strict philosophical concept of laïcité. The state does not recognize or finance any religion which fails to harmoniously uh, integrate the increasing religious diversity of its citizens and its residents. In the past, the Soviet Union and other communist countries practiced an extreme form of uh, secularism which was privileging atheism. 
soft nationalism has led, has led to some sort of categorization and hierarchization of religions and soft discrimination that has, sorry, that has been widely accepted with resignation even by minorities, even if it is not acceptable. The second issue that I will now address is the, the link between soft nationalism and religious discrimination in the context of the categorization and the hierarchy of uh, uh, religions. <coughs> Uh, the categorization and hierarchization of religion starts with the legal status of uh, the legal status to which religions have uh, access uh, by law. <coughs> Creating a religious association and acquiring legal personality is of the most important for the exercise of freedom of religion. The precise form of juridical personality varied from one system to another and the criteria are sometimes more restrictive for religious associations than non-religious associations where there is such a distinction in law. This can be the case for the requested minimum of founding members where two or three is often sufficient for a secular NGO to exert uh, its activities <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> to exert its activities uh, around the, the, the country. Why for religious associations? There is already a discrimination. It can, and it can vary from country to, to country. For example, you don't need three persons to create a religious association, but in Greece you, you need 20, and in the Czech Republic you need uh, 300 people. And if you don't manage to have those 300 people in a specific area for a local, regional, <laughs> territorial community, then you cannot be registered. Uh, you, are, you are not uh, eligible for the status of religious association. In most EU countries, there is a system of state recognition of religions, which leads to their categorization, but whatever their legal status and their position in the hierarchy, they enjoy the right of association, freedom of worship, and assembly. Each country has its own terminology and its own criteria to <coughs> categorize its religion, religious or belief. In Belgium, there are two categories of religions. Eight of them are state-recognized, while all the others are not, and can only apply for the status of non-profit associations or uh, civil associations. In Italy, there is a distinction between state-recognized religions, which have been allowed to conclude specific bilateral agreements with the state, and other religious communities which are not state-recognized. In Slovakia, there are two categories of faith communities, religious communities registered with the government and uh, civic associations. Denmark, three categories. Austria, also, a three-tier uh, system is uh, in force. In Portugal, four categories. The system of categorization uh, is far from being beyond reproach from a human rights point of view because it introduces a two-tier to multi-tiered system in which a number of religious communities and individual believers are denied some rights on the ground of their classification by the state. I would say that we have our own system of castes in, in our uh, European uh, country. Uh, some criteria giving access to the most privileged status are questionable in some countries. Portugal, for example, where there are four levels of uh, uh, categorization, uh, the threshold of 30 years of existence in the country or 60 years abroad has been uh, criticized by some religious groups, while in Austria, the minimum of 16,000 members nationwide uh, is also, of course, uh, problematic. Uh, if you don't have 16,000 people, then you cannot even apply to get the status of a religious uh, association. And that's the European Union. Some states do not uh, have any legal criteria and enjoy discretionary power, which they sometimes misuse on purpose. 
It also happens that some states have failed to answer applications or have hastily, uh, have hastily uh, uh, rejected uh, on any grounds uh, such uh, applications. What's the consequence of that soft nationalism in our European uh, countries on the life of uh, minority uh, religious groups? Those uh, religious groups of the lower categories, the lower castes, uh, are not uh, eligible to receive state subsidies, while others are, for the wages, education of their uh, clergy. Uh, they are not permitted to teach religion in public schools, where there is such a possibility, Belgium, for example. Uh, consequently, children of their members are denied appropriate uh, religious uh, classes. They are not entitled to have chaplains officially accredited in the armed forces, centers for uh, refugees, hospitals, or other social or health uh, facilities and prisons. And consequently, their members are denied appropriate pastoral care. And about this, I, I want just now to, to mention a, a case, a very interesting case that we experienced. Maybe it was through you that it happened. There was a Hindu uh, businessman from India that was in prison. From America. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, that was in prison uh, in, in Belgium. Well, because of his commercial transactions that might not have been legal, uh, I, I don't know the case. And uh, he, was he, he was asking to get appropriate food according to his religion. And that was denied to him. Uh, I got the visit of his son, and you were with him, if I remember well. Uh, I got the visit of his son and exposed the, the, the situation, and there had been no solution at all for s several months. He wanted to be released on bail and, uh, or ex uh, extradited to, to India or the United States, I don't remember uh, which country, uh, and his case to be dealt with uh, in the country where he was supposed to have committed an illegal uh, activity. And it was just before, uh, maybe one or two months, I remember, before the, the annual meeting of the OSCE in, uh, in Warsaw. And at that time, Belgium was chairing uh, the, the OSCE. And so I decided to raise that issue during that conference. I made a statement. It was uh, Tuesday morning. It was a Tuesday morning, and in the evening there was a reception at the Belgian embassy, and uh, so I met the ambassador, and then one of his staff went to me and was absolutely furious, <laughs> furious on me, furious. It's not true, and this and that and that and that. On the next day in the afternoon, he was released. <laughs> <laughs> he was released. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to sleep as well. <laughs> Again, for, for me, it's a you, it's extraordinary experience that just raising your voice, all, all, the, all the, the other strategies that fail, you raise your voice in such a big conference, our, my country was absolutely furious on me, and a few hours later, they go to some Brussels court of appeals, okay, release it. Uh, yes, so that's, that shows how important it is to, to reach influential institutions, uh, people, and, uh, and, and government. So it, I just remembered the case now reading. Uh, One little thing. Yes? He was very fortunate because his son was a chaplain in, in the United States, a very nice devotee, Brahmachari, and chaplain in New York, maybe you know him? New York City. Who's oh, what? Uh, Brahmachari? Gadada. And he spent a few months in Belgium to, you know, keep his father, keep his father a little bit in line because he was getting depressed uh, and losing weight and he was very bad. And they would not allow us to go. Yeah. So fortunately his son came, he was a chaplain, he's a devotee, he took care of him. Yeah, yeah, but we got his release. <laughs> so it was about the denial of officially accredited uh, chaplains, one of the uh, cases of the discrimination uh, in the, for, for minority religious groups. 
Yes, so other forms of the, the discrimination, they are subjected uh, to specific uh, regulations with regard to visas requested for missionaries or religious workers, uh, even volunteers who cannot get a visa to come and assist uh, any religious group from anywhere around the world. Uh, also denied access to uh, public uh, media. Uh, in countries uh, where there are, where uh, religious marriages have civil uh, effects, uh, they don't have that right to perform marriages in their own community that would have a, a civil, um, civil impact, civil effects. In many cases, they are uh, stigmatized as harmful uh, sex or cults and warned against uh, by public and private institutions, such as the CIA or NS, OSN in Belgium, or the Mivilou uh, in France, or supported by institutions supported by public power, uh, powers like the ones that I just uh, mentioned. And so, and so on. There are many other cases of discrimination reporting to, to the country and uh, the, the limitations. Uh, before going now into the details of aggressive uh, nationalism, we have three concrete uh, cases, uh, uh, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Hungary, and uh, uh, Italy. Uh, I would like to now uh, open the floor to some questions because then there will be so many uh, elements and uh, information that uh, you might forget uh, what you, you had in mind. So, I'm open to a first set of questions uh, uh, now. So, uh, if we have like, a case of religious discrimination in the country, I'd like to know how to deal with it. We have, we have a, I'm from Denmark. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there seems to be some displacement when it comes to getting missionaries into the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the demands are quite high, right? You know, we, we, we can't get, we have a recognized religion out there. We can't get, we can't get uh, this address, but, but uh, all the red tape to go, you know, to get them into the country is, uh, is enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we, we can get someone in for like half a year, then they have to go through a lot of you know, uh, courses and training that cost a lot. Yes. And, and so it, there's so I many. It's not a denial, but there's some something about to put up, put up, or you know, can one do something about that? How, how does one influence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, again, as, as, as always, I would say, is to give visibility uh, to, to such cases. So, when you send us some information about a specific case, we will publish it in our newsletter. <coughs> that will uh, get attention. Uh, from a number of members of the European Parliament or members of other Parliament, but also Parliament of Denmark, because we have the members of uh, the, 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 Europe, the, the Danish Parliament in our, in our database. Uh, and, and then we know, we see, we see who has read uh, the, the newsletter. And then we can, we, as an external actor, I would say, uh, we can contact that person if we put in place a strategy. We usually work uh, in collaboration with uh, the religious groups and with their lawyers when their lawyers are, uh, in, if they have a lawyer for, for a specific case. So the, the recipe, I would say, is always the same, is to give visibility uh, to, to such a situation. So you sent me a specific case, we treat it in our way, uh, and, and then we spread that all around the world. And then maybe it will be the State Department that will raise it through its, uh, in, in its relations with, uh, with Denmark. Or, uh, when it is out of the, the European Union, we are also involved in the human rights dialogue uh, between the European Union and, uh, uh, it can be uh, North Korea, South Korea, China, etc. And then we are uh, consulted by the EEAS, so the External Action Service of the, the European Union, uh, before there is such a, a dialogue, and we can provide them uh, <coughs> cases uh, to be put on the table or on the agenda. So that's one, one thing. Uh, in the case of Denmark, I would say through our newsletter, we can give a lot of visibility to such uh, discrimination that, that you have just mentioned. And that exists in other European countries. Huh? Sure. Yes? Uh, I'm coming from Croatia. Croatia, ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on Croatia for the moment, but a non-religious non case. Okay then, thank you. If, if we can help you, we are... Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> and uh, 
we are a secular country, but look like secular uh, because the uh, um, majority is uh, Christianity uh, Catholic. Catholic, yes. And uh, somehow in their uh, book uh, uh, for school, uh, they, they put small photo for yes. uh, some dan uh, danger religion, not religion, it's a uh, danger sect, uh, Sex, yes, uh, sectarian, and it was devotee, Hare Krishna. Some, some yes, of oh. my friend yes. himself, <laughs> me here, you know, <laughs> he, he is a uh, daughter and son going to school, oh, that, that, you are, you are danger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mother, are you danger? And uh, uh, we, we put this case from the court. And uh, if you probably, probably probably know more about that because he was in this case, uh, mm -hmm. how I know we lost this case? Hmm? Can you so at that? that time I was the... Which year was that? Uh, Just, uh, we did it. Uh, I was the chairman of National Council, so it means at least three years ago when we started. Maybe yeah, four okay. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and then we started the case. We, we first uh, approached them to remove it. Not, we didn't ask to remove all the books, mm -hmm. which are now in a, in a, in a traffic, uh, but we asked that the next books, which will be uh, uh, printed, that they are without yes. it, or they are corrected. And uh, this was our request, and they first didn't uh, respond, but they are, uh, later on they responded they will not do it. Then we took a lawyer, and it was quite, because I'm not um, this uh, type of person in, a, in a, this field, so we took a lawyer and uh, we started a case against them and it had, uh, uh, it, it took a very long time to get anything uh, from, uh, yeah. from uh, the system and then it was rejected, our uh, uh, demand, and then uh, we went to the net next level it was uh, rejected uh, again, so we practically lost the case. We had to pay the, the uh, yeah. you know, the this. But uh, uh, I managed in some way with this uh, lawyer to develop relationships. So um, she liked uh, Hare Krishna, and she was uh, uh, her speciality was uh, minorities and uh, religions. Uh, so she, we agreed that uh, we will not pay her unless uh, we win the case and then she gets uh, some percentage of it. So we didn't lose money, uh, but on the other hand uh, we lost this case. And it's interesting in this book, this is for the secondary school ethics. Yeah, yeah. And there is, uh, you know, they didn't write Hare Krishna is a dangerous movement or so on, but they, they wrote about uh, uh, all this uh, Dangerous movements and yeah. uh, how people get uh, killing yeah. themselves and so on, and so on. And then uh, uh, in this uh, paragraph, there was a picture of uh, Rata Yatra with uh, his holiness Krishna. It was very, very dangerous. It is connection between uh, uh, so Krishna movement, this yeah. one, and uh, and that. So. Yeah, Hare Krishna movement is usually targeted by the anti-sect, anti cult uh, movements and the official propaganda because they are way, they are dressed in a different way and it's easy to make a, you see a Jehovah's Witness, okay, he wears a suit, uh, a tie, um, it's no different from, from any other, other people. Huh? Uh, but in that case, for example, if we had known, if you had been in contact with us, uh, then we would have given visibility and put pressure. Uh, but what, what is important uh, you see, that, that's one of the uh, collateral damage, uh, damages of the categorizations of religions. You are on the, not on the top, not in the middle, but at the end uh, of the scale, uh, I would say, and though you are considered with suspicion by the authorities, that is reflected by the media, uh, and, and then you, you as individuals, uh, you, you suffer. Uh, you suffer from the categorization and hierarchy system uh, of uh, religion. A, a good example. Uh, and I was uh, for the moment. I'm busy with a lawyer in the, in Croatia for a case of discrimination. A serb that is discriminated in the, in Croatia. Uh, and we know what happened years ago uh, in the 1990s in, in that region in Zadar. Exactly that the discrimination happened. And uh, he went uh, through the judicial system, and there was absolutely no reaction, uh, no no follow-up of the complaint, and, and, and so on and so on. And uh, 
he didn't win, he, he, he lost uh, as well. So we know how difficult it is in Croatia as well to defend your case. But the, the, more, the more you give visibility to a case, and we can help you uh, for that, uh, the more chances there, that it will not remain un well, unnoticed, and uh, that they will have to do something, because then we will be behind to raise the case again. Because it is also one of our method, uh, methodology of... Uh, of uh, advocacy, uh, in many cases, a full report is published. It's just one shot. We do it regularly, every two weeks or every month. We come back to that case with new <coughs> elements just to keep it visible on the radar and it does not disappear in the minds of those who are uh, directly concerned. But of course, with such publicity at that time uh, uh, against the, the cults uh, uh, and so-called cults uh, and sex, that's because it was associated with brainwashing. Uh, you are keeping your people in prison uh, here, for example, or at the temples, and the children that were separated from a, a civil society and so on. What is also important in your strategy uh, is uh, to develop networking with the local authorities, to find people who at least will listen, uh, not in a negative way, to, to what you are saying, and also in the administrations. And, Quite often, we find people uh, that are receptive. I will tell you another case. Um, I was uh, in, uh, in South... Uh, no, no, it was in the Philippines. It was in the Philippines, and with my uh, partner, who was accompanying me, we went to the Austrian embassy to raise a case of an Austrian uh, person that was in trouble uh, in, in that country. And uh, my, my colleague, uh, his name was Sura. Uh, he was about uh, 25 uh, years old, and the person who received us uh, at the embassy said, well, uh, are you the son of Peter Sever? Uh, he was surprised, yes, I'm the son of Peter Sever, who is the head of Foref in uh, Vienna for religious uh, freedom. He said, oh, but I was in contact with him, uh, and I am a part of this movement that is persecuted in, in Austria. So, just contacting people, networking, uh, public relations is absolutely uh, important. Just sharing your, your views, or your, your problems, you can find receptive ears. That's not to be neglected anywhere where, where you are. Yes. Uh, you have a question, yes. So I have a question. I have a problem with the whole principle that exists very strong in Europe of two-tier or three-tier or yeah. four-tier or Concorda, or state religion. Yes. All these systems seem to be completely incompatible with you know, human rights in 20th, 21st century, uh, uh, you know, non-discrimination like that. So when I speak, when I mention this to European authorities, the first response is, well, religion is not a European matter. Exactly. exactly. So I say, okay, I, yeah. you know, I think that that's okay. But then the systems they have should not be discriminatory. So the moment they start to make categories, there is some, yeah. some level of discrimination. And yeah. then they say, yes, but culture, history. Yes. And then I say, yeah, I mean, slavery was also culturally accepted, yes. and uh, <laughs> women at body was also culturally accepted. Because in, in many ways, Europe is quite advanced in non-discrimination on gender, yeah. handicap, uh, sexual orientation, yeah. all many different things, race. But when it comes to religion, they don't want to talk about it. It's taboo, taboo, taboo. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent, excellent issue that, that, that you are uh, raising. Of course, the tiered system poses problem to the human rights uh, system, I would say, and it is conflicting in some way. There was a time when, because of this uh, issue, uh, the historicity the, of uh, the, the categories uh, and, and so on, I thought, oh, the, the best solution would be to have uh, uh, total separation, as in France, uh, between religion and, uh, and state. But when we see what happens in France, or even in Turkey, where there is also total separation, there are many uh, systems of laicity, uh, and some can be very aggressive as well uh, to, towards uh, uh, minority uh, religions. So, I've, I've dropped uh, this idea, and I have analyzed the situation in a different way. In fact, whatever the system, we must analyze it uh, with, uh, of uh, relations between state and religions in general. Uh, we must analyze it from the point of view of uh, discrimination. Uh, is it extremely discriminatory or is it not discriminatory or not that much discriminatory? 
what are the points uh, that are uh, discrimination, forms of discrimination, and let's focus on those points to, to uh, and target those points to try to uh, develop a strategy of advocacy and uh, to change the laws or, or such things. Because uh, in the uh, UK, the Queen is uh, the head of uh, is the head of, of the, the Anglican Church. It doesn't mean that uh, Anglicans, uh, the, the British system, is very discriminatory. So I think we must do uh, proceed case by case and uh, so identify the points of discrimination. Now about the European Union, say well, uh, it's not part of the mandate. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. But discrimination. That the old forms of discrimination is part of their mandate. And there, you have the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union uh, that is based in, uh, in uh, Vienna. They deal with all sorts of discriminations, but never with religious discrimination. Sometimes with, uh, well, anti-Semitism or so-called Islamophobia, etc. But it's not uh, discrimination on the basis of religion? No, they don't deal with it. And I, I've raised that issue, the, the others uh, uh, as well. There is a will somewhere, I don't know where, uh, behind the scenes maybe, not to deal with uh, this issue, although it is uh, in, in their mandate. Uh, they, and they, they we are powerless. They think it's like a Pandora's box. Once yeah, of course, it, of course, they don't then, want to open it. Then the concordats are gone and the state yeah, religions are gone. Yes, of course, then, it, yes, it, of course, it will, it, it's a Pandora box. <laughs> it, will, it will be uh, an open door to some, um, some unknown somewhere. <laughs> yeah, abso yeah, absolutely. So, and that system inherited from centuries and uh, more than uh, 1,000 years, we will not change it anyway. Uh, so we must do with it and work with it and identify the weak points, the, those that uh, pose a problem, pose problems, and attack them and reduce reduce discrimination. Yes, another question. In Denmark, if you are if you're born as a child in Denmark, then yes. automatically you are part of the state church. Yes. Uh, and then by the time that you grow up uh, and start paying taxes, then automatically you will start paying taxes to the state church. Mm, yeah. Unless that you consciously make the choice to withdraw. Withdraw. Exactly. Uh, so actually, Denmark is a quite atheistic country, but the state church is receiving huge money from people who don't utilize the church <laughs> yes. and who never like visit the church and who don't identify themselves. With the Again, a good example of soft nationalism. It's not violent, uh, but it creates discrimination, and and you you pay with your own money. You pay for other churches. <laughs> so my question is. Uh, I know that in, for example, Norway, they have a rule. Yes. You can uh, Very good become system. a member of a specific religion, and then, on behalf of you, then the Norwegian government they will give that particular religion yeah. a sum of money every year. And also, I believe in Hungary, mm -hmm. there is something similar that the citizens they can choose on which religion that they would like to pay their mm -hmm. uh, that church tax. So I was just wondering if there's any prospects of developing this, and like it yeah. seems to be yeah, yeah. There's some prospects. I, I've campaigned uh, for many years on uh, to promote a system similar to Italy. Uh, that's the Otto per mille uh, system. Uh, that is a. Uh, uh, that was used uh, by Hungary until 2010 for almost all religious groups. Uh, and I remember I was giving Hungary as a good example. Then my next point my presentation will be different uh, <laughs> towards Hungary. Uh, and so I remember at that time it was certainly 150 uh, and maybe more churches that uh, could uh, use the Otto per mille system <coughs> in Italy, but that was in Italy reduced to seven or eight uh, uh, religions. Personally, I, I say it's a good system because it's fair. It's fair. You contribute to your own church. Uh, you say, okay, I want my church, my religious group to, to get money from, from the state. And there are so many people in, in, our, in our movement that, that contribute to it. Norway is an excellent uh, example also that I, I promoted. Uh, because in, in Norway, any, any religious group, either just one community 
or a federation of communities, a regional federation of communities, or a national uh, federation of uh, communities can say to the state, well, we have uh, 2,500 members. Uh, and there is mutual, mutual trust between the state and the religious groups. And the state says, okay, you have 2,500. Uh, then we will give you uh, 1 million, for example. Uh, I think it's uh, about 30 euros, the equivalent, uh, per person in, in each group. In there was some mistrust with the Catholic Church in the last few years where the state said, oh, but I think that you are che cheating with your statistics. I don't, I don't know what was the final agreement, but it was the Catholic Church that was, well, trapped. But I'm sure they were able to defend themselves I'm sorry with, with the good cheese with uh, <laughs> lawyers. Uh, but yes, Norway is a very good system. Now Hungary, it's, it's, it's become different. But I will go back to that. One or two more questions, then we yes. have to go on. Okay. You, you mentioned that in Austria they need 15,000. 16. Uh, yes. 16. Yes. In Slovakia they need 50,000. 50,000. 50,000. There was 20,000, and now okay. they are for 50,000. 50,000. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Five, 5 million citizens. Yeah, yeah. and this is how, as a non. Uh, uh, non-state, well, uh, not recognized by the state, uh, you are sidelined, you are stigmatized, uh, you are pointed at, uh, as are strange people, uh, uh, be cautious, uh, well, preaching, preaching, yeah. preaching in, in, in the church. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay, you go on? Perhaps, okay, one more question. Maybe when we talk about it, the same question. Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> okay. So, Hungary, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Bulgaria, Bulgaria first, yes. Um, so, Bulgaria, Orthodox uh, majority uh, countries, country in which national and religious identities are very closely uh, connected. This nationalism endorsed by the state regularly leads to attempts to stigmatize, discriminate, marginalize, and demonize other religious groups. State institutions first uh, foster hostility towards non-Orthodox uh, citizens. First time I participated in an international conference, it was uh, in uh, Bulgaria in uh, 1993, and it was organized by the Bulgarian Helsinki Committee. Uh, the head is uh, Krasimir uh, Kanev, for those uh, who know. <clears throat> so, there were recent developments uh, that were a source of, uh, of concern. In May 2018, the three largest political parties in Bulgaria filed a proposed law that could be used to hinder the religious activity of Jehovah's Witnesses and the other religious minorities. In October of last year, the lawmakers approved on first reading changes to the Religious Denominations Act that would significantly restrain the rights of minority faith groups hampering theological schools, clergy training, missionary activities, free worship outside of designated buildings, and international funding of local ministries. One of the highly contentious clauses insisted on a denomination having to have at least 300 members in order to apply for official registration. Later, on the, the required membership, for official registration as a religious group was even raised to 3,000. The original intent of the lawmakers was to limit the right to open religious schools, to train denominational ministers, and to benefit from state subsidies only to communities gathering more than 1% of the population. Such a, rest a restriction would have discriminated against the Catholic Church, uh, it's 0.7%. The Protestant denominations, altogether 0.9%. The Jewish community, 700 <laughs> members. In fact, only the Orthodox Christians, 60%, <laughs> and Muslims, because historically, Ottoman Empire, also there, there is 8% of the population are Muslim. Uh, only the two, those two denominations uh, represent more than 1% uh, of the believers, so all the others would be out of the, 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 the radar and uh, discriminated uh, against. 
Whereas the bill was supposed to fight, originally to fight radical Islam, its first draft would have paradoxically given more rights to this religion than to Catholics, Protestants, uh, uh, and Jews. <laughs> That's the so-called logics, political logic sometimes, or political rules. The objective was clearly also, clearly to eradicate non-orthodox movements uh, by law. The OSCE, fortunately, the US institutions and EU institutions expressed serious concerns about the draft law. Non-orthodox believers of various faiths in Bulgaria united and organized peaceful and silent marches and protests. <coughs> carrying Bulgarian flags to show that they were true Bulgarians uh, in front of the parliament in Sofia and in many towns around the country. That's the first time that I've seen such collective and interface, uh, public interface uh, reaction. So, I think it was uh, every week at weekends, it was Saturday or Sunday, they were demonstrating all faced together uh, outside uh, the Bulgarian uh, embassy. Statements, because of the visibility, it was in the news. Then there were uh, reactions of support from the, the World Evangelical Alliance, the European Evangelical Alliance, the World Methodist Council, the European Methodist Council, the Pentecostals, the Baptists, uh, and so on and so on, the Conference of uh, European Churches. Thanks to this international mobilization, the main provisions violating freedom of religions were removed from the law voted on by the National Assembly on December the 21st of uh, uh, last year. And this was, this was really a great victory by believers of all faiths that united their forces to, to defend uh, their rights. And so that's something I would also propose to you when you, you are in trouble somewhere when it's possible to, to have such, to have such uh, uh, a united uh, resistance and uh, reaction. Now, when there is suddenly such an obstacle, uh, it's difficult to create a, co a coalition. I will tell you that there is an interesting initiative that is now migrating from, uh, from Washington. Uh, it's uh, in, uh, uh, inter-religious inter uh, inter uh, round table. There is now one in Belgium that has been created, and we are part of it, um, where groups, various groups, uh, meet every two months, every three months, and so on, and share their, their concerns. Uh, and then say, okay, we will make this move, we will write to the, the head of the European Parliament, or the head of the Belgian Parliament, and so on and so on. And then, the, as that coalition already exists, and there is suddenly a, a huge problem arising for one of the religious groups, or, or all of them, uh, well, a, a law proposed, a, a proposed law, for example, that is a source of concern, then you already have that group. So, uh, there is also one in, in Italy. So I, I can share that, info, for you, I can share that information, so that you, you join such, uh, such platforms. And that, that's the round table in Belgium, is it for European affairs or for Belgian affairs? Both. both. Okay. Yes, both. It will meet uh, here in June. And Lea, uh, my colleague, uh, represents us on the platform. <laughs> And Denmark is also represented on the platform uh, in, uh, in Belgium, someone uh, from, uh, from Denmark. So I can share all this uh, uh, with you. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was a very, really a victory by the, the believers of all faiths. And what, but what is the, the political, is it which parties were kind of pushing the like, right wing, left wing, pushing for this law, for this discriminatory law? Uh, which law? Which parties were behind this push? In Bulgaria? In Bulgaria. Ah, ah yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, that's the end. Okay, are we go to the end. Then. Oh. <laughs> are you going to go to the political party? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to, to raise the, to name the nationalist movements okay. that are behind it, and in short, in two lines, uh, say uh, who they are uh, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, I see the time is running very fast. Uh, uh, there was, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a case uh, in uh, Bulgaria that was uh, also taken uh, to the European Court, um, and it was uh, uh, the initiative of the the the, the sentence of. Uh, so there was an attack of the mosque uh, in uh, in Sofia by a Bulgarian far right party in 2011, uh, saying, oh. The mosque it makes too much noise. Uh, 
the call for believers to, to come uh, to, to the mosque, it's the case Karamet uh, versus uh, Bulgaria, and it was initiated, sorry, that complaint by a far, far right party. So the case, uh, it was about the last speakers, huh? and the case was taken to, uh, to uh, Strasbourg, and uh, so Bulgaria uh, lost and had to pay, well, let's say a, a, a small fine. Uh, so I was not going to all the details that I had prepared. But Jehovah's Witnesses were also uh, targeted by acts of violence. Just uh, two or three cases that I will mention. 1st of July 2018 in Nova Zagora, two Jehovah's Witnesses were walking down the street when a young man assaulted and punched them. Both of the women were bruised, distressed after the incident. A few days uh, later, the women filed a complaint with the police and supplied the address of the attacker. The young man had previously already attacked Jehovah's Witnesses, and the two witnesses were just sharing the Bible message uh, with uh, other people, and there was no prosecution of the, the attacker. And in several cases that I've listed uh, here, targeting Jehovah's Witnesses, there was no uh, follow-up uh, uh, in courts in, uh, in uh, Bulgaria. Now, the, the movements that are behind that aggressive uh, nationalism, so aggressive leading to uh, physical attacks or also to, to buildings of the, the communities. Uh, so, and it, it is a coalition of far right parties that is in the parliament, and so they can initiate a legislative. Uh, uh, Legislative uh, initiatives, uh, the United Patriots, uh, that is uh, in the in the in the government, grouping together uh, several uh, parties, the VMRO, the NFSB, and Ataka, especially Ataka. So now I will just in two sentences say who they are. VMRO is the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, was a revolutionary national liberation movement in the Ottoman territories in uh, Europe that operated in the 19th and 20th century. Its DNA is, of course, anti-Ottoman, and now has become, uh, therefore, uh, anti-Muslim. It was banned under communism, but was re-established as a right-wing political party in the 1990s. The other one, NFSB, is National Front for the Salvation of Bulgaria. <laughs> We already see which direction it's going. Huh? It's a nationalist party that was established in 2011 in Burgas. The party was a member of the Europe of Freedom and Democracy group that was uh, during uh, that was in the seventh uh, European Parliament uh, legislature. And Ataka, is, which is very violent, uh, asserts that it is neither left nor right, but Bulgarian. It is considered ultra-nationalist, racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Roma, anti-Muslim, and anti-Turkish. Uh, and this group uh, is closely tied to the Bulgarian Orthodox uh, Church. So these are the nationalist, uh, nationalist forces in uh, Bulgaria that really threaten directly through legislative initiatives, minority groups, and religious freedom in general. And that, of course, has an impact on the media, on society, and then on the hostility, and more than hostility, uh, uh, to, towards and against uh, 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 religious groups. Now, when I was uh, uh, investigating uh, the, the, the case, some cases in Bulgaria in Strasbourg, I discovered that there was a problem with the Arab Krishna movement. That there was uh, a movement that was uh, <laughs> that was applying for registration, almost yes. under the same name, I think. Yes. And so I would very much like to know about it as well. Because we wanted to open another branch of this company. Yes. So they denied us the right to have this branch. So we went to Strasbourg. So yes. we, we are on almost win the case, but we are on the. Uh, so it is, is it a dissident? I mean, we want to do another branch. We also have another branch. It's called in Sofia. And they yes. say, no, you, you can have only one legal entity yes. in the country. And that's what I read in the uh, European court, yes. And so? So they have to pay us some, you know, some small amount of money, but still we don't have a right to open. We should continue, you know, with the process. And we just can't open different branches. Like in Belgium, we have yes. a It also happens uh, in, uh, with the Jewish witnesses. In subsidies, they cannot uh, open 
uh, another branch. Yes, it's, it's not a new, new phenomenon, but it, for Jehovah's Witnesses it was under the same name. Yes, the same name, the same name. We have, like in the National Society for Krishna Consciousness, Bulgaria. Yes. And we want, wanted to open like branch in Sofia, you know, the city. Yes. And they, but the, the uh, yes, the initiative was taken by the Ishkom yes, uh, Bulgaria. Yes, of course. Ah, yes, okay. We just so, want to so Bulgaria is like the national body, and you want yeah, the, the, you want to the umbrella. Right yes. under the national. So, and they didn't have that for separate people. Yes, yes. But uh, real, uh, Bulgaria has always been a source of concern since the beginning of the 19th. Huh? Uh, I remember the violence uh, of, in the media there, uh, and also of politicians. Uh, and uh, a few years ago at the OSCE in Warsaw, we organized uh, with the, the representative of the Muslim minority a side event to show the violence, and we showed the uh, videos that are even uh, that can be consulted on uh, YouTube. Uh, how violent those groups like Attaka were. between soft nationalism and then aggressive and the police, nationalism. The police, they didn't came because we, we called the police and exactly. the police was just two minutes from the incident, they yeah. didn't came. Yeah, yeah. Just they left the situation like this. Yeah, yeah, they are part of it in, in a way, but, but on purpose, passive. So these, these extremist parties that you're mentioning, uh, what percentage of the vote electorate do they represent 1% or 10%? Or 10%? Uh, the percentage I don't know, but uh, they are in government. They are also their big parties. Sometimes they are like 11 per, attack on many years, they are 11, 13, 11%, 13, 20%, they are like a huge, you know. Yeah. They know it's a substantial, uh, yes, but an uh, exact percentage. Uh, and, uh, and so you see, you have what I call, I created that the concept of soft nationalism and aggressive nationalism, but uh, you, you can go from the one, uh, to, to, from one end to, 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 to the other end. And uh, we must be vigilant uh, about uh, initiatives, uh, legislative initiatives uh, in, in any country. Because sometimes uh, the authorities want to target Muslims, but they don't want to show that they, 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 they are dis discriminatory. And so then they adopt laws with a very general wording, but then that can be applied. Uh, to the other groups uh, as well and restrict uh, their, their freedom. Uh, in some countries where it said uh, uh, religious assemblies, uh, worship uh, uh, meetings can only take pla place in designated uh, buildings, that restricts your, your, your freedom of worship. When some states say, yes, but there is a propaganda coming from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar that is dangerous, uh, it, it is introduced in our country, that is a Muslim country, I think of Azerbaijan or, or other countries in Central Europe, uh, then they will adopt a general law that will have an impact on the other religious groups because they will not be able to uh, import uh, religious uh, literature. Uh, and so that's why we must all defend each other. And I said that the that initiative of a round table, interface round table, is a very good initiative. And uh, if you want that to develop in your own country, I can contact the right persons to, to organize it with you <laughs> and others. So you can also share uh, contact details of parliamentarians in this country so the bodies could meet them or things like that. Yes, yeah, yeah. There was a question? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> Oui, ok, ça va. Il y a un peu de peace. C'est 
20 pages on Hungary. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, a, yeah, it, it's a huge, huge piece of Hungary. As I said, uh, Hungary until 2010, for me, it was really a model uh, country because of the, the financing uh, system uh, in particular, and it was easy uh, to, to register. And, uh, and then uh, Orban came to power, and uh, every, every year, in a, in a democratic way, he's massively re-elected. Uh, people like Macron and others would like to be re-elected with uh, more than 50% uh, of, uh, <laughs> of the votes of, uh, of, from their, their, their citizens. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, and so uh, quite a number, I really have to make it short that uh, okay, in one question, so that so that the devotees, you or the devotees don't have to worry, would it be possible to to have the whole text later and put it in the in the package of the conference? Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. I would just revise it a little bit, okay. huh, but uh, yeah, 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 I, mean, I can put that uh, to your disposal. Uh, sure. And, and so in two, 2011, then there was a law that replaced the the, the one dating back to 1990, so the opening of the the, the country. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to the West, and uh, with that law, uh, about 250, 300 churches were deregistered. They were deregistered, and they could not be registered with the same status uh, that uh, they had uh, before, because uh, a category, a system of category of religions, was uh, put in place. It was uh, criticized by the, the Council of Europe, uh, by the Venice Commission, uh, and by other uh, institutions. That uh, change in the in the in the religious uh, legislation was not really uh, was not at all uh, not at all uh, uh, criticized by the European Union. They they focused more on other aspects of. Uh, uh, Orbán's uh, way of uh, ruling uh, the, the country, and in particular uh, freedom of expression. And we didn't really uh, manage to involve the European Union on, on that point, despite all, uh, all our efforts. So the, those churches were deregistered. Uh, they could not get any money because of the system of financing that was changed. They could not get any money uh, from, uh, for their schools, for their charities, and so on and so on. And those, all those uh, religious uh, activities that were uh, giving a good uh, picture, a positive picture of uh, uh, those uh, churches uh, had, uh, had to, to be dropped. And then afterwards, uh, Orban uh, listened, well, had to listen to the, to the criticisms coming from outside and uh, he rearranged the, the, the system of categories uh, uh, so that it could be all, well, apparently it looked like the same system of, uh, of Austria, but it was not uh, really uh, the case, and uh, the, the situation has not really improved for, them, for minority religions. At the beginning there were only a dozen groups, uh, about a dozen groups that were re-registered, or not at all re-registered, they didn't have to go to the process of uh, re-registration, and then maybe 20 more were again registered, but uh, uh, not, not more uh, than, than that. Yeah, I have a lot to say about this, but I, I will not go into to further details. Uh, and it's coming uh, only from the party of Orban, or also yeah. there's other parties who are similar, more right wing there is a, a, a general consensus, uh, I think, about it, and it's now the, the, the parliament that decides uh, uh, it needs a special majority that it can get, so they re it reflects the, the, the mindset of, of the, the people, the opinions of, of, of the people. But, uh, as I said, I had the first an Orthodox country in the East, uh, uh, well, a Catholic country in the, well, Central Europe, and now I wanted to come to Italy. <laughs> I want briefly to uh, come uh, to, to Italy, uh, where, so we see with the elections as well, the, the rise of... So here you're going to talk about soft, soft nationalism. <laughs> so, yeah, Italy, so we, we all know huh, what is the situation. Italian, everything is soft. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, we all know uh, what, uh, what is the situation in Italy and with the elections uh, uh, here at the European uh, Parliament. Uh, uh, so we see the rise of not only populist, on the right, on the left, populist uh, movements, 
but uh, also of uh, extreme right uh, uh, movements. And uh, we know now that there is that, that conflict between Macron and uh, Salvini. They have two uh, opposite views of the future of the European Union. And just a little clarification. Yeah. Salvini is not the Prime Minister of Italy. No, no. no. Uh, is he the Prime Minister? No, no, no. Ah, no. okay, no, okay. Just, just, yeah, just for us to know. Yeah, yes, he's, yes. He's a minister? Yes. But he's not the Prime Minister. But he's, he's, we speak more about him than the Prime Minister. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, yes. Because he's from the Lega. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, already presented as an extreme right uh, uh, movement. So his characteristic is of is anti-immigrants and is therefore anti-Muslim. Uh, and uh, of course, and, and everybody can say, oh, okay, it's just just <laughs> an anti-Muslim, so I don't feel uh, threatened. Uh, but it's it's always dangerous to, to think like that because, as I said, uh, they can introduce some laws that will be restrictive for the Muslims and that can be implemented afterwards to, to, to other groups with other amendments in one year, three years, five years, uh, ten years. So uh, we cannot follow him uh, on, on this issue. I would say it's still soft, uh, soft uh, nationalism because it's not violent. Uh, it, it does not incite to, to, to violence, it, it, but it rejects. It is uh, against inclusiveness, that, that's for sure. And of course, we know that the geographical position of Italy uh, makes it uh, unique uh, in the European Union because it gets all the waves uh, of uh, immigrants coming from North Africa, Central Africa, uh, Sub Saharan uh, Africa, and they, they must certainly be held by the European Union uh, to, to, to face uh, this, uh, this phenomenon. About, uh, some statistics anyway, international statistics about uh, uh, Italy. The Pew Research Center is the most known, uh, most reliable uh, research center about uh, uh, religious uh, issues in the world. It is uh, American, it is uh, respected in Europe despite the fact that it is uh, American. So it's ranked uh, Italy, <laughs> yeah, but the things have changed over the last, uh, the last uh, 20 years. So it ranked Italy second out of 10 European countries for bias against Muslims and asserted that 69% of people have uh, a negative view of Muslim worshippers. A report of the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECFI, also observed persistent anti-Islamic prejudices within the Italian uh, society. And there are also fake news that are uh, spread around by uh, by Sibili and, and the Lega and uh, and uh, others as well. So there was a, a report by uh, the Italian Chamber of Deputies, Joe Cox Committee on Hate, Intolerance, Xenophobia and Racism. The committee's final report confirmed high level of prejudice and misinformation in Italy with widespread forms of religious intolerance and discrimination. According to the report, 40% of Italian people believe that non-Christian migrants represent a threat to Italian society, while 26.9% are against allowing the construction of buildings for non-Christian religions. And 41% oppose the construction of mosques. If we let that phenomenon uh, take roots in society, oh yes, um, mosque we don't want, and then we don't react, you are a Krishna and a bird, you are a sweet seed, etc. Then the next victim might be you. <laughs> so that's why you, you really must unite our efforts beyond the, the divisions, uh, of course, uh, uh, between the, your, your, your theologies. Uh, Minister of Interior Matteo Salvini from the Lega Party is well known for his statements against uh, immigrants, uh, Roma gypsies, Muslims living or arriving uh, in the country. And I have a few quotes and I will leave it to that because before going to the latest statistics. In January 2017, Salvini declared in an interview about African immigrants landing on Italian shores, if I become Minister of the Interior, before, I will ditch them on African shores with peanuts and a goodbye. This is not acceptable, that must be absolutely denounced, because then it can be said about any, any other uh, religion. And uh, the latest uh, uh, statistics from the, the Joe Cox uh, 
uh, committee that I mentioned. 54% uh, believe that the minorities must adapt their culture to the majority's culture. 60% perceive the migration from Islamic countries as a threat to the West. Which, which country? Hmm? In Italy, in Italy, in Italy, in Italy, yes. So 60% perceive the migration from Islamic countries as a threat for the West. 60% associate Islam to jihadism, and therefore the association between religion and terrorism is still very strong. 44% think that Muslims living regularly in the country have the right to build mosques, although 31% of the interviewees do not agree with this point. So that it's uh, conflicting. Uh, the, the society is divided, not really true, but that the fact that there are so many, so many prejudices by such an important share of the population is a concern. Because as I say, it can, it can, and it will be, it will spill over if. Uh, far right movements came came uh, come to power in the future. I will not say more about something at the moment. <laughs> I mean, there are there are questions. Sorry. Interaggressive person. <laughs> yeah. I want to say something because they have quite experience. Yes. Yeah. Relating with uh, all these things that you are putting now. One of the main problems with the Muslim is that they are not interacting as, uh, with the inter interfaith groups. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is a big problem. They don't come. Mm -hmm. For this not because they don't want. Because many of them don't speak the language, they don't know what to do. Now they are one person that is living in Florence, where, where we are. Our, uh, and you, you speak about Italy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I speak about Italy. I'm from Italy. I'm from Italy. So the representative of the Muslim uh, community is uh, Uko, that is uh, the, 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 the bigger He's a very nice person, and you know, he's a, one of the Imam of Florence, the main, the preeminent Imam. He just had to be very in the mosque to distribute food to them, also with some politicians yeah. and other people. But it's a problem that we discuss a lot of time, they don't come. So mm -hmm. also the perception of the, the, the normal people, because you put Salvini, Salvini is okay, using all these things just to get what he wants, you know. <coughs> and the normal people, they don't have perception because they, they are not interacting with the, with the, with the society. And also the risk that we have in many places, many, many places, because the people they don't know, they are Christian, they just they have their consideration for them. <coughs> the Muslim is a real problem. So he is going to meet you know, in, the, in, the, in the official meeting, like when you have the cardinal, the pope, the you know, three main religions, they are shaking their heads, but the people they are not, no. they don't know them. So mm -hmm. also this kind of nationality can rise up very quickly, because they take the bad example from, from, uh, from the Muslim, and they took it, uh, as all the Muslim are like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for Italy, as I said before, uh, there is now a round table, such an interface round table. Yeah. Uh, I can put you in contact with them. Also through Massimo which, 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 which you, you group, must know which him. Group Sorry? Which group is? Maybe we can, we can talk. Yes, yeah, we, we can talk. Uh, yeah. Does it have the same name in every country? Or, or yes, it's a round table, the Italian round table. Interfaith round table. Uh, it's IRF. Uh, in short, I think it's IRF, Interreligious. Forum, I think. Interreligious Forum Round Table. Is Greg uh, Greg in the in Washington? Greg uh, Matthew, I think is uh, yeah, Matthew, I think. This is but I, I have all the contacts for that, huh? that I can uh, send you and you can share. Uh, and also give me your your name and email address, uh, and then I will keep you informed about everything. <laughs> you can be sure about this. <laughs> if you want to get an email every day about. <laughs> Bad things that are happening in relation to. And if you want to unsubscribe, you unsubscribe. <laughs> yes, Christina. I have been on your email list. Yes, yes. 25 years. Yes. And I just want to uh, uh, like emphasize what you said. I think it's really important because nationalism, uh, nationalism in many forms is on the rise in Europe. Yes. And you know, we are the strange looking people. Mm -hmm. You know, for, uh, following an Indian religion, like yeah. we are, we could be, we could be very, very easily targeted. So I think ISCON as an organization, we really have to make. I feel that we, we really have to need, need some like proactive step to kind of prevent it from happening. It's not only for ourselves as for <coughs> other religious groups, mm -hmm. but rather than just reacting to the difficulties, I think we would we should come up with a strategy because it's it's just getting rampant. Mm. Although the European parliamentary elections were pretty like a little hopeful, like God bless the Scandinavian mm -hmm. uh, for for the you know who was the, the Green Party like 
Netherlands. The, the liberals and the greens. Yeah, yeah. So like, at least some normals is, is still there. Mm. But but I feel that we need we need to kind of have to we need to be prepared to some serious difficulties. Yes. Gonna yeah. Yeah. Face. Sure. Yeah. So. yeah. But I showed the two extremes. So the, the soft cases and then yeah. depressive cases. Yeah. But that one is not that far from the other. Because no, 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 no. Some, some crazy Just an incident, crazy and then some politicians take initiatives, yeah. and they are supported by by the, the populations and the media, and that's it. That's, that's how it. A, a law can be passed, right? as it was the case with anti sect laws in France, in Belgium, uh, and, and other countries. Huh? Exactly. Just a, an incident, or two or three similar incidents. Yeah, and a few populists. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of, uh, of the media, yeah, and, and, and now the social media. Yeah. That uh, reinforce the prejudices. Somebody had a question there? Yeah. Uh, two, three. Yes. Maybe I you can present yourself who you are first, oh. and then. And then. Oh. Me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Krishna. Um, my name is Marty, I'm from the UK. Mm. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your talk. It's really informative and I've learned a lot. Um, so my question is, is um, given that you've mentioned three countries, and all those three countries are EU member states, yes. right, and have to follow the tenets of EU law, uh, namely the Convention, the Europe, the, um, EC, Convention of Human Rights, mm -hmm. and Article 9 deals with this whole um, uh, area uh, of um, yes. freedom of uh, uh, expression, religion, conscience. Um, why is it that um, these, uh, that um, although you know certain groups are given the right to practice their religion mm -hmm. under the Article Nine rights? Um, and 9.2, I think, of the Convention rights, yes. um, a state can interfere. Yes. Oh, why, yeah. are, why is the state failing to interfere and, um, and impose some form of sanction or um, uh, uh, stop these nationalist um, movements from, um, from you know, uh, yeah. allowing other groups to practice mm -hmm. their religion? Paragraph 2, in fact, allows the state to restrict in special yes. conditions uh, your freedom of, of uh, your freedom of, of religion, morale, security, uh, uh, etc. Uh, but th there are uh, other instruments that can be uh, just the law, uh, as it is, can can be used. Incitement to to uh, religious, ethnic, uh, racism, uh, uh, things. Yes, yes. So there are there are enough articles, I would say, in the criminal law. To, to prosecute uh, those who spread around uh, uh, such prejudices, uh, intolerance, uh, uh, hate speech, hate speech. Yeah. Yeah. And also, in uh, the same vein, as Article Two, that the state, you know, having then imposed certain laws and restrictions, and given the whole point about, um, you know, laws against Muslims, where they can argue it is in public, in, in, in the, it falls within the realm of public order that they have actually created such laws um, and for the safety of other individuals within that country, um, uh, why again are none of the other member states under Article, I think it's Article <coughs> of the Lisbon Treaty, not bring any action against uh, the countries that do not then follow the tenets of EU law? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it does, EU does not deal with freedom of religion yeah. or, or, or belief, huh? uh, only the, the discrimination. Huh? Uh, we see also, uh, well, with concern, some legislative developments that under the, 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 well, in the name of or under the guise of public safety and terrorism that there are more and more laws and initiatives that restrict, uh, that regulate, officially regulate, but in fact restrict uh, freedom of religion. And I think that will go on in increasing in, uh, in, in many countries, uh, wearing uh, the veil, uh, so hiding the, the, the face is, is 
one of those uh, examples where is it forbidden, where is it not forbidden, and so that's a huge, uh, another huge uh, debate. But I, I, I think that uh, the criminal law in the current situation in many European countries uh, is, is sufficient to prosecute uh, any case. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that certain countries in Europe have a stronger sense of you know, sticking within the law, staying within the law, and even if there's discrimination or, or different things, it seems it wouldn't go so extreme as places where the police doesn't react to violence. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in the UK, that would be really unheard of that the police doesn't react when no. somebody's mm -hmm. attacked, no matter what faith, what color, whatever. So it seems like certain countries in Europe are a little bit more protected, that there might be discrimination from the, like she was saying, we have to be yeah. careful, but to me it seems quite inconceivable that in places like Holland, Belgium, France, like that, that the situation could become to the point where there's actual physical persecution or, or violence. Like but I, I think the difference is uh, here, is that in some countries like Bulgaria and, uh, and others, uh, and some others in Central and, and Eastern Europe, there is that identification of uh, the, the state identity uh, connected to a religious identity. Right. While in France, Belgium, uh, there is that separation in UK uh, as well. So I don't see that as an imminent danger for sure. And from my point of view, even more uh, on a more longer term, uh, on the longer term uh, in, in our country. Yes. But could be more discrimination, more inclusiveness. That, that's what. Yeah. We, but like physical persecution and attacking, that seems to be. But we see a, a huge increase in anti-Semitic uh, right. uh, incidents huh? uh, and violence against people, against the buildings. Yeah. Uh, something that is uh, almost never said, uh, because there are also positive news. Uh, and I said that in private conversation yesterday. Uh, Anti-Semitism is on the increase uh, in the Western Europe. And it's really a recent study that was sent to me. Uh, but there are few incidents few anti-Semitic incidents in the Central and Eastern Europe uh, in comparison with, with Western Europe. Now, about Islamophobia in France, the statistics are going down the last two years. This, this way, these are official statistics, this may be surprising, uh, but it's a fact. You will not hear that on a regular, uh, and not even at all, you will not hear that uh, in, the, in the media. But the increase of anti-Semitism in France is huge, and also now in, in Germany uh, as well. And the sources are quite varied. They we have the usual, the usual Nazi extreme rights, uh, uh, extreme yes, extreme rights uh, movements, but also Muslims that have migrated uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, uh, now that foster uh, uh, anti-Semitism, and you have. Uh, uh, also other other groups, anarchists, uh, for example, uh, as well, and also the new form. One of the new forms that anti-Semitism is uh, taking uh, is that another terminology is used, but the the, the result is the same: is anti-Zionism. Mm -hmm. And the, and the, under the fight against Zionism, Zionism in French. Uh, then they criticize Israel, and, and, and Israel is all over the Jews uh, everywhere. And that is very dangerous because this is the, the stand that has been adopted by uh, left movements and extreme left movements, like Mélenchon, etc., but also Corbyn in, uh, in the UK, that has been uh, repeatedly now uh, accused of uh, anti uh, Semitism. So anti Zionism now is the new. <laughs> slogan uh, to bypass the anti-Semitism. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I'm be a little contentious because I'm from the UK. And yes. We're not sure if we're in Europe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's three years. <laughs> but you've been focusing mainly, particularly with the uh, the kind of hard problems you have, um, the extreme ones, uh, on what we would call more right wing. There's a kind of perception now in the UK that the left-wing agenda, and I'm going to be a little contentious, as is often associated with human rights, yes. is now becoming a threat. And even in my own work, because I work in religious education, yes. and in the mid-90s, the Christian right was very much opposing yes. the multiculturalism. 
We found now that actually the danger a little bit for our organization who goes out to schools is sometimes coming from the left, and we're afraid to go into classes and say, boys and girls, we're, you know, we can get criticized because of some of the political correctness. Um, are you aware of those problems? That Absolutely. You're still, you, you are. So <laughs> you're, you're not just siding on the side of human rights, but you're aware of some of the people who are actually even adopting a kind of human rights approach yes. to promote things like uh, gender flexibility. And in the UK now, there are some yes. Muslims who are saying they, they object to their children when in primary school discussing it, issues of, of gender when they feel that it's inappropriate. So are you evolution, aware? Evolution as well. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes so yes. you are aware of those issues. And how do you feel? Would you classify those as soft? Or how would you see those? Well, I, I would not relate that to nationalism. Ah, yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> so soft nationalism, no. Uh, oh, so are, yes. are you dealing only yeah. with nationalism, or are you, are you looking at? No, no. Here from this conference, I was we are asked to talk. Yeah, to, oh, to talk about the, the nationalism. Does, does your organisation deal with the problem of secular fundamentalism? Which yes, is quite a, you do as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. All, all sorts of fundamentalism, also from the Christian right. So coming from the, the United States, to make it a, a very short and schematic. Uh, but also the, the resistance in schools, uh, I'm more aware about what's happening in French schools, uh, uh, the resistance in schools by uh, students, Muslim students, to be taught anything about Holocaust, for example. In some cool schools in France, it becomes impossible to, to talk for teacher, uh, to talk about uh, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and, and so it means that uh, that uh, that way coming now from uh, Muslim, some Muslim groups uh, is to challenge the let's say the traditional uh, European values, if I can use the word European values. Uh, if, uh, I'm sorry, I should, I should, there are no European values, human rights values, let's say <laughs> universal values. <laughs> yes. Just a quick point, I think. Um, obviously, your brief is to talk about nationalisms, and which is, of course, you've done a very good job of that, and obviously, you're really experienced. I think, from a, a slightly right of centre UK vision of it, I think perhaps a touched on it, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different view, which is that Europe appears to be naive about the Islamic Trojan horse, of the Islamic extremism in particular, which is different from nationalism. But it kind of justifies the, the nationalistic point of view. You've got to understand where they're coming from, where their fears are. Because in cities like Luton, we've got terrorists trained in, in Islamic schools and things like that. There's a problem with Islam. Yeah. yeah and yeah. you can't you can't go around supporting the building of mosques so that later on to save our temples. Because there's one percent of Muslims in the UK that are extreme. That would not deny terrorism. You know. That's serious. What yes, no, no. That? That's, I can talk about that. It's a separate issue. <laughs> because we, we work on it. We need to have a balance. We work on it very, very closely. And I'm quite often furious uh, because, in the name of uh, Islamophobia, there is now censorship and self censorship. Self censorship by the media. Uh, also, I see the trend among the young generation of people who graduate from universities uh, and, and arrive in our, well, well, in the human rights uh, family, that, okay, we must be, well, they don't say we must be politically correct, but that's what they are, that's what they have been told <coughs> and told in universities. And now I have to... I would say I have from the old generation of human rights activists. <laughs> and uh, we, we see that increasing gap with the, the mindset of those young people that arrive on the market, uh, I would say. And we say, no, that's, uh, oh, that's everything that becomes in their eyes, oh, that's discriminatory. That's discriminatory. Uh, there a concrete, uh, concrete case I was working on uh, uh, this week with my colleague, young colleague. Um, about specific uh, treatment of uh, prisoners in the uh, Spanish uh, prisons. And uh, in that specific uh, uh, system, it's called FIES, number five, the top, is mentioned, uh, okay, they're very dangerous people and uh, Islamic uh, terrorists. 
Oh, that's discriminatory. <coughs> that's the reaction that I got. And now I expect that sort of, re of reaction from young uh, human rights activists that come from, from universities. But that's, that's what they are being taught. So I said, no, it's not, it's not a religious discrimination because Islamism, it's not a religion, it's a political ideology. It's a political ideology. So, uh, when we were criticizing communism, it was a political uh, ideology. Uh, the same Islamism. Yes, but we should not uh, use the word Islam, Islamism, associate Islam to, to terrorism. I had this sort of reaction in, in, the, in the human rights uh, uh, family. <laughs> and so that's a, a, a huge issue that I would like to work, to, to, not to work, to, to talk about. And I published, and I published very cautiously and using a very well carved uh, I, um, terminology. Just to be, to be sure that I can be listened to by any, any party. Any party. That's why, for example, say, we reject uh, the terms. We never use the terms anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Christianism, and then it's anti-anything. Huh? Yeah. It's anti-anything. I heard anti-Russian, anti uh, uh, sorry, uh, Russian, uh, Russian phobia, Russian phobia. I saw yeah. Armenia phobia. It's yeah. never ending. Yeah. But let's talk about anti-Jews. Then it's separate from Israel issue. Uh, let's talk about anti-Muslims because in Islamophobia you put anything to restrict freedom of speech and freedom of thought. But that's another 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 debate. <laughs> so we'd like to thank Minister Terry. I have a very quick, curious question. Uh, my name is Sonia Chopra. I'm from the United States. Um, I know you touch very very lightly on social media. Like you didn't really expand about no, it. But no, no. So are you using that, those memes, and how much impact does it have here, like uh, well yes. in the U.S., <laughs> and how we as a group yes. can assist you if things like these come up in different countries, and how can we assist you in spreading that through social yeah. media? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, yes, and, and embarrassing for me because uh, I am not personally, uh, I'm from the old generation, I'd say, and so, you know, social media, uh, I don't use that. But my colleagues at the office, they, they use that. But personally, I don't see much impact. Because, uh, as I said at the beginning of, when I presented our organization, uh, my objective was to reach uh, decision makers, politicians, media people, etc. Uh, to multiply, to amplify uh, the, the messages, the news that we wanted to, to bring to the attention to uh, influential uh, people. And I don't see that I can reach that goal uh, through the social media. Uh, because I have 10,000 email addresses, I have all the members of the European Parliament, through the social media I will not reach them. Maybe some of them. But so my, my young colleagues try to, to convince me. I say, okay, go do it your way. <laughs> I will not uh, prevent you from doing that, but you still have to convince me. But it, it, we, I mean, we need experts, and uh, I am not. Uh, and uh, but I would encourage you to use the social media because it's it's a fact that for uh, election campaigns and for other big events uh, like that, uh, they have a huge influence. So, it's just my personal limitations. What is it? Is he leaving? Is he in his... No, he's going to stay here until lunch. Okay. Yes. In the afternoon, yeah, he, he goes to, to Madrid, he has other engagements. Yeah. If you guys stay here at least a little bit, maybe later, his thoughts on the future. He painted a very interesting picture, like we're on the edge. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts from the inside. And of that the would future. be like a whole presentation. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> 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 right, well, we wait half an hour over time. We have to stop it. So we'd like to thank him very much for the presentation.